At first, it was an ordinary bachelorette party. The women who worked at Winchester Logistics, at least those who worked in the warehouse, got their paychecks on the last Friday of the month and decided that this was the best opportunity to get together. Hillary really enjoyed completely relaxing in the company of her friends. Most of them, like her, were married, and this was a chance to have fun, taking a break from routine work. Hillary's husband, Patty, didn't mind at all, but other husbands didn't seem to care what their wives did as long as they had dinner on the table when they got home. At work, Hillary felt some superiority over her colleagues, although she tried not to show it. They were all working-class women doing boring, repetitive jobs because they needed the money. But her patty was well off, and Hillary didn't need to work. She thought being a stay-at-home wife would be fun, but she soon became bored and took a job far below her capabilities. She liked to communicate with women who came from the environment she once knew. And when they exchanged stories about what they did during their holidays in Ibiza and Torremolinos, she laughed at their adventures, but did not take part in them herself. She and Patty vacationed more often in Singapore and Bali. The girls tried most of the city's establishments and eventually settled on the hotel Tollgate. The hotel tried to keep its guests and locals from wandering around the city by hosting music and dancing every Friday and Saturday night. The ballroom had many dimly lit corners, and their husbands never went there. So the place was ideal to have a blast without attracting anyone's attention. The location was perfect for Hillary. It wasn't too far for most girls, but for her, it meant a rather long taxi ride. Hillary had a great time that first evening. Soon, she was relaxing with other girls and started flirting. Watching them, especially the married ones, dancing and caresses, turned her on. She drank five glasses of wine, but only paid for one. Danced with four different men. Extreme, at least one married woman from their gang, slipped upstairs for an hour with a stranger. Two more spent time in the parking lot. They all later agreed that any indiscretions would never be discussed outside of their bacheloretta party. And next month, they will definitely find a partner. Returning home, Hilary felt sexy and rejuvenated, and Patty was glad she had a good time. While attending Secretarial College, she was wailed, but soon discovered that she had a submissive side as well. She had a lot of boyfriends, and she let them do whatever they wanted to her. But one day she overheard two classmates talking about themselves. They started talking about her. Then Hillary decided to put things in order in her life. She met Patty and he became her savior. Marriage was supposed to calm her down. They got married and honeymooned in Hawaii. Her wild, hedonistic days were behind her. There are only two such houses left in the prestigious part of the city. They were believed to be the oldest in the area. They were not listed as architectural monuments and were not old enough to merit a protection order, but passers-by stopped and admired them. They were semi-detached and had numbers one and two on Bristol Road. In house number one lived Mr. Barnes, who had retired. Patty and Hillary lived in house number two, which they inherited from Patty's parents. He liked this place, despite the creaks and drafts. Patty ran his own business, Patty's Projects, working from home. He designed warehouses, home extensions, and parking lots, and word of mouth brought him a steady stream of orders. His drawings, made using a computer, did not quite meet the standards of architects, but they were more than enough to obtain local planning permission. The next month, Hillary found herself in the arms of a handsome man, tall with black hair, gray at the temples. His name was Arthur, and last month he slowly danced with her. She hoped that he would come again. The song was loud and he leaned towards her ear. I really enjoy your company, Hillary. Could we sit down in a quiet place for a moment to have a good conversation? After 18 years of marriage, Hillary again felt her former wildness. Sex with Patty was always satisfying, although it wasn't frequent enough. But the low light level and naughty co-workers turned her on. Patty had made love to her, but now she wanted to make love to a stranger. Okay, let's find a quieter table, she readily agreed. They moved to a darker area, away from the stage. Without asking what Hillary would like, he went for drinks. When he returned, he pulled his chair next to hers. You said you work for Winchester Logistics? Yes, she answered, 
The girls I'm here with today also work in their warehouse, like me. It sounded rather derogatory, but Hillary didn't care. She felt like a representative of the common people. However, she didn't want to seem like a typical manual worker, so she added, I studied to be a secretary, but work in a warehouse was all I could find here. Well, I work as a sales director at Empire Holdings on the other side of town. I think a woman with your style should be a personal assistant. And it so happened that I was just looking for such a woman. Hillary was flattered. She knew men found her attractive, but she had never been called stylish before. If Arthur really has a job for her, Hillary will quit in no time. Of course, she'll miss her friends, but that's what this bachelorette party was all about. She wished she had worn something more seductive. Sitting next to the strong man, she felt a tingling sensation spreading from her chest to her groin. Handsome, sexy, possibly having the best job for her. How could she resist? That's very nice of you, Arthur. Tell me more. They chatted for another twelve minutes, and he continued to flatter her. Soon his arm was slung over the back of her chair. From time to time he touched her shoulder. It was nice talking to you, Arthur. He interrupted her. Next time we talk, we should rent a room and discuss the position of a personal assistant. We can take a bottle of wine with us. Hillary didn't know what to answer. On the one hand, he boldly assumed that she would agree. Undoubtedly, sex is on his mind. But on the other hand, she also wants sex. This handsome man clearly wants her, and she wants him. However, you shouldn't make his task too easy. Perhaps I should go back to my friends, she said. Most of them are busy right now, he replied. She looked at their table. Only Irene and Doris were left there, talking with two men. Tracy went out onto the dance floor with two black guys. The rest of the girls are nowhere to be seen. At least two of your friends went to the men's room. I think a few more came out into the parking lot. Now Irene kissed the young guy, and Doris sat on the older man's lap. Hillary knew that she would not be welcome at the table. The idea of sex with Arthur was tempting, and her friends probably expected it from her. She crossed her legs and took a sip of wine. Can I have another drink, please? The house was large, and Patty had converted the dining room into his office. He and Hillary almost never invited guests to dinner. On those rare occasions when he had to attract potential clients, he and Hillary would take them to a nearby restaurant. Their dining table was now his workspace, and next to his computer was a large printer. He had just finished expanding the warehouse and checked his phone. It was amazing how quickly time flew by. It was already past 11. Last month, Hillary returned home around 10.30. The girls must have gossiped a lot today. He put on his pajamas and was still sleeping when she came into the house at 11.30. Yeah, your red face gives you away, he said. Hillary blushed even more. What do you mean? she asked. She panicked. Did he really go to Tollgate and see her? There was no time to shower, and she prayed that he wouldn't try to check her underwear. The red face tells me everything I need to know. You drank more glasses of wine than you should have, I think at least three. Her relief was almost palpable, and her heartbeat slowed to near normal. The following week, Hillary called Doris. The girls enjoyed the flirting and everything else, so much that they decided to go there twice a month and hoped that Hillary would join them. All of them had either already had sex or were planning to. She agreed. Remember I told you about the musical evening, baby? Yes. You said that you liked dancing. Yes, but it's also about the atmosphere. You can find out news there. I know I work with girls, but we are scattered throughout the warehouse and don't get together often. I danced a few times. We all danced, but I quickly put the guys in their place if they push too hard. I have no doubt about it. So do you want to offer something? Yes, the girls want to go more often. Offered twice a month. What do you say? Well, a bachelorette party every two weeks doesn't seem excessive as long as you behave. I'll behave, baby. But Hillary thought quite the opposite. She was looking forward to the next session, especially the fact that sex would be on the menu. This new Hillary was now a cheater and wanted sex again, with or without work. One lunchtime, she snuck out of work and bought a bottle of baby oil and a pair of slimming stockings at the mall, and also a red thong that was very small. 
Arthur didn't just offer to buy it, he gave orders. Hillary was not used to being ordered around, and this made her tremble again. On the way to work, she looked in the glove compartment. She should keep her supplies for Arthur in it. Patty didn't usually look in her purse, but it was better to be safe than sorry. They began their secret meetings. Patty had just been paid for a large garage project that was to be added to the front corner of a client's house. This was to lengthen the front and widen the rear to accommodate a laundry room and toilet below. At the beginning of the project, he wondered why the client specified an air gap on the exterior wall. An internal wall of aerated block and an external wall of brick must be built with metal ties connecting them. This is not necessary for a garage. Today, he found out why. Planning permission had been approved, but the client now wanted to reapply to build an additional floor above the garage, so needed a stronger load-bearing wall. Patty was asked to design a shower room with a bathroom at the rear, a dressing room at the front, and a computer nook in between. He estimated the additional cost. This additional plan would take more time to develop, and it would cost more, but Patty didn't want to start work until he visited the site to take measurements. He has drawings of the object, but he did not trust them. Often they showed the architect's original plan and not as is. Based on the client's instructions, he designed a standard width garage, but the bathroom above it can be improved if you can squeeze in another five centimeters. He had an internal debate. Should he start the drawing tonight or wait until he is in the house? And I decided to go get my sloppy. This is an Irish club. As his last name suggests, he is of Irish descent, although he has never lived in the old country. But in Shalala, where his grandparents were born, he has an uncle. As a wedding gift, his uncle sent Patty a souvenir Sheila, a piece of hardened thorn, essentially a club. It has traditional bumps along the shaft and a thickening at the end. He always grinned while holding her in his arms. In the movie A Few Good Men, Tom Cruise said that he always thinks better with a baseball bat. Patty picked it up from its place of honor above the fireplace and tossed it from hand to hand, saying loudly in an Irish accent, I always think better when I have a Sheila in my hand. Hillary entered. What are you doing with her? She asked. Think. He paced back and forth around the room, slapping the heavy end against his palm. What are you thinking about? About what extra five centimeters can do? She sighed. A taxi horn was heard outside. Then I'll, uh, go and meet the girls. And she left. But Patty had time to see the worry flash across her face, even fear. He looked at, let's go and threw her on the sofa. Surely she didn't think he would hit her with it. And yet that's exactly what her face said. And why didn't she kiss him goodbye as usual? He pulled back the curtain and watched her approach the taxi. Her red blouse was almost transparent, her black bra showing through, and the black pleated skirt was the shortest she ever owned. Hillary doesn't look depraved, but she's already halfway there. She stopped her car, unlocked the passenger door, and took a plastic bag out of the glove compartment. What's in it? Patty wasn't usually suspicious, but he was far from stupid. He'll check her car later. He picked up the shalala and began to walk back and forth again. In the taxi, Hillary calmed down. Patty was just acting weird. He must have been thinking about something else, because he would never have hit her. His strange remark about extra centimeters had nothing to do with her. She soon calmed down and entered the hotel, heading straight to the toilets. In the booth, she opened her purse, the largest she owned. Pulling out a plastic bag, she took off her bra, panties, and tights. She stuffed them into a bag and pushed it into the corner of her purse. Then she took off her shoes, pulled on her thong and stockings, and put her shoes back on. In the mirror, she painted her lips with red lipstick. It matched her stockings. Now she actually looked like an approachable woman. Ideal. This is exactly the effect she wanted. She double-checked that she had baby oil and walked into the bar. Arthur stood up and greeted her, his hug and kiss causing a familiar tingle. She said hello to a few of the girls, and she and Arthur had a drink to check in. Irene and Doris were already sitting on their boyfriend's laps and quickly waved to her. Tracy was dancing with two black guys again. 
Hillary shuddered. The thought of being caught between two men brought back memories. She had already done this in her youth and liked it. She couldn't wait to get to Arthur's room and kiss at him before the elevator doors closed. As soon as they arrived, Arthur ordered her to undress, treating her like a servant. At home, she has a good husband who works to provide her with vacations and expensive clothes. And so his unfaithful wife takes off her clothes in front of another man and is about to sleep with a stranger. Entering the bar, Hillary was in her element. She hoped that one of the girls would see her, but she immediately noticed her target at the bar. Hello, are you John? She asked. He turned and smiled at her and then stared openly at her. I can become one, he answered. I'll be happy to change my name to whatever you like. She turned away, muttering, Sorry. No, it didn't bother me, he said as she left. If it's not enough, come to me again if you can't find it. She saw another man matching the description, sitting at a far table, twirling a glass of red wine in his hands. She crossed the floor, aware that many eyes were watching her, both men and women. Aren't you John? she asked. Perhaps yes, he replied, grinning. Sit here for a minute. She doubted. What if this is not the man? But his smirk was very knowing, and she sat down opposite him. Who cares? After all, this is what a woman of easy virtue does. She crossed her legs. I take it you're looking for a specific John? Yes, replied Hillary. I think it's you. Okay, I'm the HR director at Empire Holdings. Employment contracts with new employees, for example, with a new assistant, must be agreed upon with me and with the head of the relevant department, for example, with the sales director. You are the John I need. That's what I like to hear. She went with him to Arthur's room. The taxi arrived just after 11. Is there any reason why you're wearing a man's jacket? Yes, she answered, unbuttoning it. Some guy was dancing with Doris, and when he brought her back to our table, he picked up his drink and started hitting on her. She hit him so hard in the face that he staggered and spilled red wine on me. She practiced this excuse in a taxi. He was so embarrassed that he gave me his jacket to cover the mess. Luckily, nothing got on the skirt. Hillary opened her jacket and showed him her soaked blouse. It's clear. It can be worse, Hillary continued. I didn't let him get in the taxi with me, so I returned home alone, but I had to tell him our address. Tomorrow morning, he will come for his jacket. Lying in bed, Patty remained calm and waited for her to fall asleep, then slipped out into the street with the car keys. The package in the glove compartment confirmed his worst fears, this means that not only girls took part in this fortnightly outing. He changed all the things and went inside to check the man's jacket. Nothing. The next day he was trimming the hedge in front of the house. Autumn has arrived, and this haircut is the last of the year. Patty had just started work on his side when Mr. Barnes came out. Thank you for doing this. Hillary gone shopping? Yes. I have good news and bad news, son and I thought it would be better to tell you while she's not around. Patty put down the scissors. Let's start with the bad one. I have an infection, that is, at home. It's called dry rot, and there's a lot of wood in both of our houses, and if I have it, you almost certainly have it too. What are the signs? I'd better check. I didn't notice anything from my side. Look for deep cracks in exposed beams. Also, crumbling wood and orange spores are a fungus. I took a photo of it and checked what it was on the internet. Thank you. I will do so. But now give me the good news, although I doubt they will be very good. You might be surprised. Come in and have a beer. I have a nephew who works for the local council, and he overheard something he shouldn't have overheard. And he certainly shouldn't have told me. So what I say next will remain strictly between us, okay? My mouth is on traps. Some of his colleagues in higher positions were discussing the agenda for the upcoming meeting before April 6th, the new tax year. They need to prepare all their affairs for financial planning for the next year. One developer is asking for permission to build a dozen expensive homes, creating a new neighborhood. Last year he was refused, but this year he came back with an improved offer, 10 houses, a bar restaurant, and a mini supermarket. It will be accepted. So, what's the good news? Do they need a computer-aided design designer? 
No, they are going to serve you and me with forced purchase orders. Below us, there is land that the developer needs. What? After all these years, will we have to sell everything and move? Why is this good? I will say. Local authorities know that our homes are unique. Even with normal compulsory purchases, they pay 10% more than the market value as compensation for the trouble. And they pay for the real estate agent, the lawyer, and the relocation. For our two, they will most likely raise the price by 20%. So, you and Hillary will get a very good price for staying somewhere else. Think about it. Do you want to stay here while the infection is being treated? It will be an expensive hassle, and you will never get your money back for the work done. And for the forced purchase of an infected house, you will get a pittance. So when they make an offer, don't mention dry rot. And don't even think about calling an expert. Then the problem will become public knowledge. Patty thought for a moment and said, I would like you to do something for me. When Hillary returned from the store, Patty's car was gone. Mr. Barnes' haircut, living hedge. Oh, looks like you cut our hair too, Mr. Barnes. Thank you. Don't know where Patty went? He needed to visit a client. Something to do with precise measurements. Perhaps he will return soon. Could we have a few words first? Certainly. Hillary put away her purchases and joined him. I know Patty has lived here all his life. So what I say is very much his. We'll be upset. It will be better if you say it. I'm not going to tell him anything. What the hell happened? Yesterday a wood expert came to see me. When Patty returned, he went on the offensive to unsettle Hillary and see if she would keep the bad news from him. He avoided a full-scale attack, wanting only to keep her on edge. So what did you do at your bachelorette party? He asked. I'm not sure I like it. Do you like what? I didn't do anything. I noticed that there are no wine stains on your underwear. Did you film them at that hotel? Have you been looking in my underwear drawer? He didn't answer, looking at her silently. When the silence became uncomfortable, he spoke again. So you filmed them in that hotel? Hillary was preparing for this and was already expecting interrogation. First of all, I certainly didn't take off my underwear. It's outrageous. But she took off her bra shortly before the incident. It irritated me. I think maybe it wasn't rinsed properly and the washing powder gave me irritation. So when the guy attacked Doris and she spilled her wine on me, and yes, I had been braless for five minutes, and when I got wet, everyone could see my chest where it was stuck. That's why he lent me his jacket. I had nothing on my skirt, so there was no reason for my panties to get dirty. Then, if your bra was clean, why did you put it in the laundry basket? I said that because it wasn't rinsed properly. Okay, I understand. Sorry. Patty thought Hillary's answer was quite clever to justify her reason for taking off her bra, but still not enough. In her original story, it was the guy who spilled the wine, but now it turned out to be Doris. However, the plan was to shake it up a little. Since she didn't mention dry rot, she's probably going to leave him. He didn't know what to do if she mentioned it. But she didn't mention it and at the next bacheloretto party, she burst into tears and said that she didn't feel well. He checked her phone and went through all the girls, starting with Amy, and they all had a similar message from her. Sorry, I can't come. He was sure that she was cheating, but it seems that this idea is dead at the moment. Perhaps he scared her away. If the affair was a one-time affair, he could live with it. But it still bothered him that she didn't tell him about the infection. He clarified what Barnes told her exactly. He never found out that Arthur Mycroft was hiding under Amy's name, but in the end, it didn't change anything. A week later, Hillary told him news from Winchester Logistics. There was a Halloween party there. Everyone and their partners were invited. And you know, it will take place at the hotel. Tollgate and coincides with our bachelorette party next Friday. It sounds tempting, I could go back to being a masked lumberjack, if we still have the costume. I think he's in the attic. And this time Winchester actually went to town, booked the entire hotel. Anyone who reserves a room the night before will be able to get it for free. Patty didn't need a clear plan. He answered immediately. Great! Book a room for us. 
It was the Wednesday before the party. Patty got his lumberjack suit out of the attic. While there, he noticed an unpleasant smell of mold. When Hillary returned from work, he told her the sad news. My uncle from Ireland just called me, he said. It's his birthday on Friday and he wants me to come visit him for the weekend. But you've never done this before. Yes, but he was just diagnosed with cancer. Perhaps this meeting with him will be the last. Not the best time, but I have to go. You'll miss the party. That's what I mean when I talk about the wrong time. But you'll know more people there than I do, and you look fantastic in that gothic witch costume. You should still go and use our number. It'll save you money on taxi fares, and you'll get free breakfast. Well, if you're sure. Patty left on Thursday afternoon. His departure was accompanied by hugs, kisses, and the words, Tell your uncle that I'm praying for him. He left his lumberjack costume where she could see it, but brought a new outfit with him. He was amused that he stopped for the night at Tollgate. As soon as he left, Hillary called Arthur with good news. It's wonderful, he said. Fate has conspired to bring us together. John and I will come in fancy dress. In Tollgate. They refused to make reservations for outsiders, but didn't say anything about the party. Therefore, everyone will be allowed in if they are wearing a suit. To sum it up, when you become my assistant, there will be times when you will have to entertain my most important clients. Yes, I know what I have to do. This sounds funny. You passed two interviews and you're a good fit for me. If you can satisfy John and me at the last interview at the party, you can start work on Monday. You don't have to give notice to quit your warehouse job. Just you'll let me know about your boss tomorrow evening. Halloween can be your farewell event. I think I can guess what my last interview will be like. I'm sure you're guessing, but I'll confirm. You will take John and me to your room. Oh, yes. You will entertain us all night, although we will leave before breakfast. And on Monday, when you start work, you'll spend the morning with the CEO of Empire. Patty entered the hotel ballroom 15 minutes before kickoff. He was dressed as the Grim Reaper, a black cloak with a hood, under which was a black mask that covered his entire face except his eyes. The braid was slightly wobbly, but no one expected it to be real. He grabbed a drink at the free bar. He didn't drink cider often, but today the dry blackthorn seemed especially appropriate and made him smile. More and more people in suits arrived and he remained silent and mingled with them. Apparently, some of them were watching him, wondering who he was. But no one asked any questions. People are naturally wary of death. Luck was on his side. He soon recognized the Pirati, who was joined by a masked man from the Scream Franchisi. The Pirati stopped at a house alone on Bristol Road to pick up his coat. There's Chaus there, said Scream. Everyone arrived at once and the administration doesn't even try to register people properly. I'll get an extra key later. What room are we in? 216th, two double beds, although we'll only need one for the first couple of hours. Is our new assistant here yet? No, she's on her way. Look for a goth witch. Patty was tempted to try to gain access to this room as quickly as possible, but he forced himself to wait for Hillary to arrive. When she appeared, she obviously knew how the guys would be dressed and immediately headed towards them. They exchanged hugs, not paying attention to the Grim Reaper standing next to them. He was able to hear their plans. Hillary will inform her boss that she is leaving. Then she will go around everyone and say goodbye to her friends. The entire process should take no more than three glasses of wine, i.e., about an hour. When the initial rush subsided, Patty finished his cider and went to the reception. I left something in my room he said. Please give me the key to room 216. I'll bring it back right away. I dare not refuse you, sir. The woman at the counter laughed. I don't want to die today. Patty leaned forward and took the key. You people misunderstand me. I don't kill people. I simply separate the soul from the body when it's time. Where it ends up is none of my business. However, I keep an eye on those who sin, so you better behave. He unlocked the room left the door open, and returned the key. Returning to 216, he decided to hide in the bathroom so as not to remain in plain sight for long. Finally, the trio appeared, bursting into the room. They stood in silence for a minute, 
and then began to throw things away. Patty watched them and couldn't help but smile at their priorities. Pirate Arthur took off his hat, jacket, mustache, and beard. John took off the scream mask and cape, and the witch took off her pointed cap, dress, and underwear, remaining naked, with the exception of black fishnet stockings. John went to the bathroom, zipping up his zipper, and received an unexpected blow. Grim Reaper turned to face the other two, frozen in place. Patty? asked Hillary. Arthur's eyes glazed over and he remained seated. Patty picked up the shillelagh again. Stop! Hillary shouted. She stepped towards him and grabbed the thick end of the baton. He froze. Please stop, Patty. Look what you've done. Is it worth a life sentence? Am I worth it? Her last words sunk in. No, this traitor is not worth going to jail. He lowered the baton and came to his senses. He needs to think sensibly. He will soon need to negotiate a divorce. I'll convince the guys not to call the police. She turned and looked at John, who nodded without taking his eyes off Juicy. Go home, Patty. Think about what you want from this situation, and on Sunday, I will come and talk to you and you'll pick up your things while you're with me. Yes, if that's what you want. Sunday arrived and Hillary arrived at 10. Patty didn't have to think long about what he wanted. It's simple, divorce and home. The conversation started with her unnecessary explanations. She got carried away, returning to her former slutty self. Then it came to divorce. But my betrayal doesn't matter. I still have the right to half of everything, including the house. Patty knew she was just playing a role. To make it easier to part with, she will agree to everything. She didn't really want anything to do with the infested house. Maybe that's true, he objected. But I also have the right to a wife who doesn't play around. If an angry husband shows up screaming, that's a bad start. Yours career as a personal assistant. If you start telling everyone who will listen what you did to get this job. Okay, what do you want so as not to make a fuss? Take your things half the furniture, and half the bank balance. I'm keeping what's left in the house. Hillary looked disappointed. Okay, but I'll also keep the car you paid for. Two hours later, she was driving away in her car, the trunk and back seat filled with her belongings. She laughed. Keep it, Patty, she said out loud. A couple more years and it will collapse on you. Patty thought that without Hillary's clutter, the apartment looked empty, which was fine with him. The next week, he called his expert, not to confirm the presence of dry rot, but to check old furniture. The only casualty was the piano, which he couldn't play anyway. It was burned, and the rest of the furniture was declared free of infection. Patty put the more important things in storage. Hillary loved her new job, although she missed her home at one Bristol Road. The divorce was quick and easy, and she didn't have to see Patty when it was finalized. Their paths did not cross for several months. Her new apartment was small, but quite acceptable. The sex was amazing. She quickly got used to the new way of life. So your butt is itching? asked the doctor. Yes, and in the last few days it has started to hurt a little when I poop. Sitting down opposite the doctor, she asked, what was the matter? He took off his latex gloves and threw them into the basket. I took samples from the sore spot and will get the results very soon. But I regret to inform you, Mrs. Boyle, that you have a medical condition. Based on the results of the analysis, I will be able to determine which strain of the virus it is. By law, you must tell your husband. We are divorced. This happened after we separated. Then you should tell your current partner or partners and they should also get tested. If any of them develop sores or rashes, they, in turn, should inform all other contacts. Oh my God, can this be cured? The good news is that you can. I am confident that my diagnosis is correct, so I will prescribe you medications right away. They will relieve your symptoms and reduce their severity in future outbreaks. So this can happen again? Unfortunately, yes, we can only treat, but not cure, completely. The herpes virus remains in the human body forever. Arthur and John were shocked by this news. Both were also confirmed to have the disease, and the hunt for suspects began. 
Of course, no one blamed Hillary, but her work had become quite routine. She attended only one more bachelorette party, and then she stopped going there altogether. She missed working at Winchester Logistics and her friends. Her life became lonely. After fully confessing to his doctor, it was confirmed that the virus did not start with Arthur or John, so Patty could not have contracted it. She wanted to visit him, and she drove to the end of Bristol Road. But the smallest number was now three. Behind it was a large construction site full of excavators and other equipment. She got out of the car and approached the only man in a suite and a yellow helmet. You are not allowed to enter the construction site, madam, he said, blocking her path. What's happening? New development. Ten houses to order. We are opening a sales office tomorrow if you are interested. What happened to houses one and two? Demolished and will be restored. But number one has already been sold to some rich Irishman. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.